Okay, welcome everyone to a Q&A session about sabbaticals. I'm uh, Matt Cheney. I'm here primarily uh, to run this through the CoLab, but also partly as uh, president of PSU AAUP, which oversees our contract, which has uh, lots of info on sabbatical uh, in it. We also have with us Nate Bowditch um, from the Office of Academic and Laura Dijkstra, who has been chair of the committee, which is a relatively new thing with our new contract that we're still uh, working through, and Laura will have lots um, to share with us about that, I'm sure. Um, so I'm going to stay out of the way unless necessary. I'm going to put, for those of you online, I'm going to put some links in the chat to our CBA so you can see the exact language. I have some printouts for everyone else if you want those. Um, <laughs> Matt, as long as you're putting things in the chat, can I send you a link to the actual, like a PDF of the sabbatical form? Yes, so please do. Can, okay, Either or Teams or email actually. will work for that. Okay. And um, I'll turn it over to you all. Um, whoever would like to start. Um, I can start. Um, so I, um, I can just share a little bit about the work that the sabbatical committee has done with the Office of Academic Affairs to revise the sabbatical application form so that it more closely aligns with our CBA. Uh, and I can share that new form with folks. The new form is uh, live on OAA's website under forms. However, we currently can't click through it and see the questions unless we fill it out. Right. So <laughs> I had that problem too. So I had this. I brought, uh, I brought PDFs. I, I, had um, to submit a, I had to submit an application yeah, to see the whole thing. So, <laughs> so I brought, Kristen very yeah. generously shared the, the PDF um, with me and I, I this, but... sent Matt a link so that he can hopefully share that with folks on Zoom as well so that you can see the questions beforehand because I know it is a little bit easier to prepare your answers and then copy and paste it into the form than trying to figure out ahead of time, like how long is this gonna take? What does this entail? And all of that good stuff. Uh, so the sabbatical committee met over the summer and also met with our provost to propose some changes, and the provost had some changes to propose as well, to the previously existing sabbatical form, because that was created before we had uh, the CBA. And so the questions on the previous sabbatical form didn't necessarily line up very well with the criteria that were laid out in the CBA, and that was a challenge last year in trying to determine um, eligibility and sort of quality of sabbatical applications, because individuals were not necessarily prompted with what we said we were evaluating them on in the CBA. So we worked over the summer um, with each other and with the Office of Academic Affairs and have adjusted the sabbatical application form such that um, it now includes the criteria that is laid out in the collective bargaining agreement. So that language is right in the form so there's no confusion uh, and you're specifically mm -hmm. prompted to first describe your project, right? To sort of lay out the, the scope and what your plans are and things like that. And then we ask a follow-up question that is meant to prompt you to specifically think about those aspects in the collective bargaining agreement that your sabbatical application is meant to cover and make sure that you have indeed covered those items and if you feel like you want to expand on any of those items there is space for you to do that um so a lot of the sabbatical form right now has to do with sort of sorting and criteria and things like that in terms of what kind of sabbatical you're looking for and um how long it's been since you had another leave of absence, all of those criteria are laid out in the CBA. The specific questions that your sabbatical committee is going to be looking at are 
question number 14, where it says, please describe the current proposed project, right? And that's your opportunity to lay it on us, right? Tell us everything it is that you are hoping to do. This is not a grant application. I don't, you can include anything that you want in that space, but please don't feel obligated to like give a literature review or, you know, something elaborate. We're more interested in the work that you are proposing and wanting to do than work that has been done previously. Um, and then in question 15, again, you're prompted with those four specific criteria that the CBA addresses and asks if you want to provide any additional or supporting information to help the sabbatical committee understand how you're fulfilling those criteria within your sabbatical project. Um, Nate, was there anything that you wanted to add about the revisions to the form? No, I mean, I, I think they're really good. It was just the, the old form felt like it had been worked on and tinkered with over the years until it was kind of incoherent and didn't really make much sense. And I think directly referencing the CBA is the most clear way. And then just saying, make sort of helping everyone with these <laughs> supplementary questions in 15 to just make sure you address all of those, the criteria in the CBA. Um, what I did have one question I just realized, but so what if someone wants to use more than 4,000 characters? I just realized looking at this, like, I know this, I've seen this, all, I'm guilty. I'm just sort of a, I mean, in some ways it's good. It does speak to your question. We don't want a dissertation. We don't want, this is not, you know, a, a NASA applica application. So between 14 and 15, you should have plenty of word count to say everything you need to say. Uh, I guess if there are cases where that's not the case, we can figure that out on an individual basis. But. Yeah, we didn't have anyone go over the character count last year. Right, and they were plenty robust. So, and they were think, plenty robust. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, but other than that, I just think it's clean. Um, it's supposed to be set up, uh, and I think it is that early on. Just if anyone's curious, with respect to number three, if you click leave without pay, you get directed to another page where you explain. You would answer your question about, you know, why do you need to leave and whatever, but specifically about the leave without pay. So that there is a fork in the road for that. Um, but beyond that, no, I just think it's a big improvement. Um, so thank you for the work you did on it. And we did meet in the middle. I did, we, I sort of was on, I had a kind of looking at things one way and the committee came back looking at them a different way and we ended up meeting in the middle. And I think this is a good outcome. So thank you. Yeah. Um, do you want to speak a little bit on the process, like the workflow of each of the pieces, how it sort of goes to your program coordinator, AU leader first, and works its way through? Would that can be I helpful? Just, for can I ask a clarifying question before you go on? Um, there are some form things in the chat. Am I correct in thinking, so So I, I kind of started already, and I was using the form that's posted at OAA. And I think the one that Matt just put on is different. Um, so maybe this Fine is- Fine question. Yeah. When you say the form that was posted on OAA, so there were two forms that were posted on OAA, right? One was in the document section. If you filtered by sabbatical, there was an old version of the it, We've since form removed, there right? That has since we been had, removed. We found that, sorry. But that was only removed yesterday. Right. No, I just went to one just now, which I posted in the chat. Um, I clicked on, you know, forms, and then I clicked on sabbatical and leaves of absence. And then- there's a form there, but it does not look um, like like the one that Look matches. It post, yeah, it's not the same because the one that matches posted has a little preamble at the top. That's like <laughs> this form will be submitted, blah, blah, blah. But the other one. Yeah, they're, I think they're different forms. So right. I will just alert OAA to maybe check when you go to forms and then you click on sabbatical. Um, which I think is the way that like, if you weren't at this session and you were just going to apply for sabbatical, you would probably go there because that's what I did and that's what I've been using. So, okay, sorry. Why isn't it? It doesn't have the this form. Thing. It doesn't have this part up here. Is it does? Online. Yeah. Mine, mine doesn't. 
Yeah. Okay, that's right. It's the same one that Matt's looking at, so I'm just confused. So like I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just when I look at it, oh, I see. It just it is there. It just doesn't pop up. Um. So yeah. Just down. yeah so it looks it different. Down. It looks different, but you think that's the same form? Is that what I'm hearing? It is. Okay. You have yeah. to you have to click fill in the form and then go next, and it's, yeah. it's, so it's a completely online form, which was yeah. intentional. This PDF and when it is pops just up. It like doesn't have the top part, but you can go back up and look at it. So I see. Okay, perfect. Now I know Woo! where. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so as to the the workflow, so it goes. Yes, it's submitted as per the form. It goes to the um, discipline coordinator technically, and then it goes from there to the sabbatical committee. So clarifying yes. question: discipline coordinator, or AU leader. Different people. Right. Yeah. My understanding is it's discipline coordinator. The purpose of it going to the discipline coordinator is for the discipline coordinator to fill out their own form regarding how, um, regarding a plan for how to cover right. your classes. So I would say whoever does the scheduling for you. Mm. But there's a list of in in the thing where it says yep. who's your dis who's your discipline uh what is your program who's your program coordinator when you need her when I clicked on this scheduling. before right. it Mary Beth Ray's name was not in there my okay. name was not in there only Becky Noel's was in there she's our AU leader okay. she does not do the scheduling mm -hmm. all right I'll check on this yeah that's a good question about the workflow. It seems like folks... it should be AU leaders who would then reach out to program coordinators if they needed. How the form is set right now. I'll confirm with Kristen. She's out sick, but my guess is that's what she did. And then it goes for scheduling purposes at the AU leader, but I'll check. So the form will ping the AU leader. Yeah. And perhaps in the short term, since these applications are due shortly. Yeah. Um, we can send some communication out to AU leaders that if they have someone in their academic unit who is up for sabbatical, that the questionnaire that AU or that yeah. the powers that be are responsible for can go to whoever is responsible. Because that varies sabbatical. radically, obviously, well, AU to AU. It does. And, and it's also if you're an AU. Someone like, for someone like me, it's a problem as well because I am my own discipline coordinator. I schedule my own classes, but I also teach CMS classes. Right. So I don't know. I, I don't care, but right. you just need to be aware of yeah. the, these complexities. And do and AU leaders go just directly to Nate? Like I'm an AU leader applying with that. And a PAM is, I see, I think. So does it go directly to Nate? Goes to the sabbatical committee. For the sabbatical right? committee and doesn't have that intermediary step. So to clarify your question, if someone who is teaching faculty who is also an AU leader, are you asking who would fill out their form about coverage of classes and things like that? I think they would have to fill out their own form, quite honestly. If they're the ones who are responsible for scheduling, they would have to... Yeah, because it's just that it's only it's it's purely a bureaucratic who's going to cover the class. Yeah. This thing, it's not. Yeah. It's not. If you, unlike the sabbatical committee or yes. me, where we're looking at the substance, it is the, not. A it, the, it's not a review of the substance of the proposal. It's a question about covering while the sabbatical happens. If so, it fill happens. it out for myself. Fill out for yourself. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for. All right. Yes, that's a good clarifying question. So on the, which is not included here, on the form that goes to AU leaders, it's literally just about like, what classes would this person normally teach in this semester? What is the plan for this class? Will yeah. it just not be offered? Is somebody else covering yeah. it? Is it being covered by an adjunct or enrolled is basically yeah. what- There's no what review of like. the There's of the no substance. review of the proposal. Yeah. That would um, include like advising loads and everything else as well. I believe it only. Yeah, it mentions teaching and service coverage, I think. I have to go back and look at it. No, well, I didn't think it mentioned service, but it's been a while since I looked at it. I'll go back well, and look. Well, advising is part of teaching. Yeah, yeah so. advising is part of teaching. Yeah. But Lourdes and I went over it, but it was a, a ways back. And you looked at what we've done as well, and there wasn't yeah. anything tricky about it. No. Right. 
So it should be familiar. I don't think there were any big changes. There were no big changes. Really, the only the primary change that we made to that form was there used to be a question on that form that did prompt the coordinator or leader to respond to the sabbatical application. Right. And we removed that because that is not, according to the CBA, they That's are not, not a level part of oversight. Of the, in not a part of review. It's just sabbatical review. So. Yeah. Um, so basically the workflow goes to the discipline coordinator. It then goes to the office of academic affairs who confirm eligibility and all eligible applications. So and eligibility is just based on the criteria in the CBA. Yeah. All eligible applications are then forwarded to the committee. And so I always think that they come from the committee to me, but in fact, they don't. They go to OA. I don't see them until yeah. I get right. So I don't even. It's not you. I don't <laughs> review the eligibility. That's done by um, by Kristen in my office who double checks. Um, so I don't see them for me looking at the substance as opposed to eligibility or how we're going to cover the classes. I don't see it until it's a, a review of the proposal itself right. at the end of the process. So it goes to the sabbatical committee. The sabbatical committees review all of them. Um, they vote on all of them, whether or not to endorse them. They are not ranked or anything else. It's just a vote of whether to endorse this application or not endorse applica this application. Um, for each application, a brief sort of write-up is completed that basically, you know, presents to the Office of Academic Affairs, yes, we endorse this application for the following reasons, uh, based on the criteria laid out in the CBA, or no, we don't endorse this application for the following reasons, based on the criteria that are laid out in the CBA. Can I ask one question just for the process? So when we, it goes from the discipline coordinator, and then we send it to, we send the whole application to OAA to, to, for eligibility, and then does academic affairs send it to the committee or then we get it back and we send it to No, the no, it goes from academic affairs from Kristen sent it if it's eligible to the sabbatical committee. Okay. And I don't see it until whatever the date is, the first okay. of December, eighth of December. I forget which one. So it will not be returned to you to no. be like now jump through this new book no. to send it to these people. No. Thank you. Once it's submitted, you're all set. Okay. Um so I guess there's some questions I had that, and I mean, I so a couple things I'll say at the outset. So I'm happy, to, it's important to me to hear what everyone here thinks about as much as I wanna talk about what I think of when I'm reviewing a sabbatical. I wanted to hear what <laughs> people who review sabbaticals at this table, I wanna hear what how that's done, how you view it. It's important for me to hear that. I don't want it to just be, you know, me in, a, in an echo chamber. So I, I did want to talk about both what others think about, you know, expectations and, and how you think about that as well as my own. But I also did have a question related where this sort of intersection of process and substance, which is about the review, the util, what are what is the expectation of the review process? Because ideally a review process should be an opportunity to, to, to look at things and, and an opportunity for improvement. Right. And, and it's sort of an opportunity to give feedback and iterate and, and develop something that's stronger. And in its current schedule, it really the way the process is designed schedule wise, it doesn't encourage that. I think, is that a fair way to say it? Yes, Do you agree? Absolutely. So uh, we don't have to answer that now. Right now we have a deadline of November 15th. But I think as a group, right, as the faculty and me, I, I think we should be thinking about even if this is what the CBA says, is there a way for us to be helping applicants work through and develop really strong applications? Because what I, um, how do I, I'll try and be tactful. My sense was, and that the committee found themselves in the same position sort of I did last year, which is, okay, here you go. It's either yes or no. And that, that I don't really think is the ideal what, I mean, that's not beneficial because it. Can we talk about the nose? So, so can you give us a sense of why either the committee or you have said no? None of us said no in my one cycle at Plymouth State, but it was not unproblematic because it was really. And then I tried, I'm just being open with everyone. I tried to, early on. I got them and said, "Ooh, I got to pay attention to this. I'm not. 
I have con so I did contact people to after the committee had done their work, but the committee felt like they had no time. They had no turnaround time to go and talk to people and after a conversation, go talk to the applicant and make some constructive suggestions. They had no time to do that. So they were kind of, I, I can't speak for the committee, but my impression was they were kind of up or down. Yeah, and I can then speak it came on this a little bit because I was on the committee last year. Um, and to, to reiterate Nate's point, the committee last year did feel very much that typically in an academic process, the review process is iterative, right? Where like revise and resubmit, right? Like strengthen here, it. Here, here were the questions that we had. Can you more fully address them and flush this out in your application? And so make her better so ticking all the boxes, right? And and we lamented the fact that we didn't have that opportunity especially because of the flaws in the form that was being used last year and how the form didn't specifically prompt people to address the criteria in the CBA. We felt like there were situations where information was missing or was not clear. And while all of these sabbatical applications were endorsed, not all of those votes were unanimous. Yeah. Um, and, and part of the reason for that a lot of it did have to do with missing information, right? Where the proposal was just not well explained and it was very unclear whether or not it met the criteria that it was meant to meet. Um, and so if we had had the opportunity to then communicate with that faculty member and say, here are the questions that we have, can you, you know, add another paragraph or better explain this aspect of it, I feel like that definitely would have made for stronger applications and a lot fewer questions on our end. And I got an echo of that same experience on my end. And then I tried, I had a little more time than the committee. I, I think I have a month. So I did reach out to people, but then I was in the awkward position of suggesting that the committee was wrong or that I was menacing someone because I was asking questions instead of saying, okay, as we come towards the finish line, let's put together as strong an application as we can. Maybe there's some things that aren't clear here. What, what about X, Y, and Z? Instead, it was like I was threatening people or something. It was, you know, which is not how it should be. So I don't think we need to address this today, but I think in talking to Laura and my experience last year, we're tied to these deadlines, but I think our process could really be improved to make it interest, like, you know, it's a better, more interesting process that will result in stronger applications, which is good for all of us. And it'll result, I believe, in stronger sabbatical experience. That's where I'm not sure I agree <laughs> with okay. that. Um, I don't, I mean, it doesn't, it, the, that process isn't allowed according to the CBA. The CBA. I don't see anything in there that it seems like it could be an iterative process, but I don't know that I believe that simply because you have somebody say the right words on an application, it means that their actual sabbatical work is going to be stronger. So I, I, I'm a little no, but I, I, no, no, no. I'm not saying it's a guarantee, but I no, am no. saying if you if you really clearly lay out in an application for something your plans and what you think you're going to produce, right? That's a that's a that's more. We can met there is a more measurable sense of but how, how did it go for what purpose? Like there is no consequence, right? So well, that's but... that's part of what like I, I worry about building processes that have increased work for all of the people involved for no measurable gain in the end product. Okay, and, so and so that that's what I worry about. Okay, honestly. the last I, I, another version of this I've done elsewhere when you submitted your application, you also said you had to document what had come of your last sabbatical based on the goals that you'd set for your last sabbatical so that you kind of couldn't hide from it if you said you were going to, and it was more research oriented as opposed to scholarship and it wasn't the lawyer model. So it made it a little easier to say, okay, I'm going to publish three articles and do X, Y, and Z. Did you or not? And so I think I you're right in the current mode that question but I, there are ways of making it um you know have a, a little more meat on that bone robin has a question yeah i would i would first of all i would 
agree with Kathy for multiple reasons, you know, first the contract, but second of all, like the reality of producing your application and then versus what actually happens when you engage in your project. Like there's only so much time you can devote to understanding where your project's going to lead at the beginning. And so somebody from outside your field, like, I don't know if that kind of iterative process is that helpful there. What I do think is that the application should have standards for the content of the application. And that's what you can hold people to, right? If somebody just writes I might do this, like that's not enough, right? They have to really go into depth and the application should be what, you know, what gets you there. And if the application is not requiring enough for you to feel like, you know, you have a sense of the project, then I would say we need to, you know, fix the application form so that it's robust enough. But I think that's an, enough. The bigger question I have is it, it used to be, and as an AU leader, now I'm a little confused about what's happening now, but it used to be that when you came back from sabbatical, you did produce. Oh, you still do. Yeah. Still so do. I haven't seen that as an AU leader for like one of my people who just came back. And I guess, and I certainly want to, wouldn't want to hold people to like doing exactly what's on the application because obviously like, you know, things change enormously. But I guess one of the questions I have is like, you know, you either pass or fail on your application because you either do the work or you don't do the work of the application, yeah. right? So I have no problem with somebody failing because they turned in an application that is not, you know, it doesn't meet the parameters that the application requires. But I yeah. am curious about what happens if somebody doesn't do a robust project on their actual sabbatical. And that is very thorny, right? Because it's already happened and you've already given it to them. So do they pay it back? A, you know, um, that's a conversation for another day. I think. Right. But I guess that's my point is like, that's the real failure, right? Is, is at the end, there should be no failure in the application um, with the project, unless somebody does not rise to the requirements of the application, like, and I think that's why it's kind of a rubber stamp for the um, committee is that they're not evaluating, you know, the how great this chemistry project is. They're just looking at this rubric and making sure that the application hits those things. And like, there's many chances that it could be better if chemists, you know, engage, but we're kind of trusting the faculty member that they're going to engage in that kind of peer reviewed, you know, research process when they're doing their project, right? I don't think the committee is going to be helpful with that or the provost necessarily, especially that early in the project. So I, I think it's pretty good the way that it is, although I don't know what you do if somebody, you know, doesn't deliver. So I can speak to this a little bit. I can't speak to what happens if somebody doesn't deliver because that is no, it's not far outside yeah. the scope of yeah. my purview. Um, but with regard to some of your earlier questions, so the sabbatical committee does not have widespread disciplinary knowledge in every area of Nor do they need to. the institution, right? I, If I am reading a sabbatical application, I more often than not am not qualified to evaluate the the proposed project in terms of disciplinary content and and things like that. I I don't consider that my job. And even if there were an iterative process, which we all agree there isn't right now and can't be right now because of the CBA, um, I, I think the iteration there is there are things that aren't clear to the committee about whether or not you're meeting the criteria. We would love to be able to give you a sabbatical if you can demonstrate that you are meeting those criteria, right? And, and that the opportunity for that conversation with the faculty member um, is the opportunity that the sabbatical committee wished they had been able to have last year. So, that makes sense to me. <laughs> me too. Yeah. So that was really where that came from, yeah. right? Like, would there ever be an opportunity to be able to punt something back to a faculty member and say, you know, 
here's our feedback right now. We definitely see where you're addressing this, this, and this based on the criteria. We're unclear on this other aspect. Can you help us clarify so that, you know, we can see that you're... No, and that was the same thing. Again, it just, yeah, making sure you're touching on the criteria in the application. I am not a disciplinary expert in almost any area, right? So it's the, I had the same challenge where I would love to have been able to say, I'm not stepping on your disciplinary toes or your research mojo. I just don't quite understand this part of the proposed project. So I wonder if, and I know you just revised the form, so you're not going to do this for this year, but I wonder if one way to be more likely to ensure that everybody's touching on everything is to actually split those four criteria out and make people address one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm but... not laughing at you. It's because when we initially made the proposals for the new form, that's exactly what the sabbatical committee did. Yeah. Yeah, um, and we went back and forth, a bit. and so we can try that another time. I mean, I don't think either of us care one way or the other. It seemed like this was a better way to do it. But there was I mean, concern Flitner, that it would become very repetitive with people yeah. first describing the project and, and then, then going back cutting and addressing and pasting each. practically. Um, and so that was why we sort of landed or met in the middle with that one follow-up question that specifically referenced the four categories instead of four follow-up questions. It's really questions in, that really in four 14. In but I had that same yeah. thought, Kathy. That was but exactly in 14, in theory, all of those four criteria should be addressed when you complete the box in 14, right? And 15 is like, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have read it that way. 14 to me is describe your project. 15, how does it fit in the larger context okay. of things? That's how I would have read it as yep. well. Yep. But we can try that next time if you want to break them up. I don't I, I don't care. You're yeah. you're the ones who are saying that people aren't addressing and responding. I mean, I just think you have to build user interfaces that make people do what you want them to do, right? Yeah. There was more specificity in the old form with respect to the criteria and the I, I, at least as I remember it. And it so but so I, the I'll old try. form had a similar question, like describe your project. And then it asked specifically about like teaching and learning. Yeah. Um, so it was not explicitly addressing the four criteria that were laid out. But we'll see how this goes. And maybe after a run through, we'll agree that try another way yeah. and see if we get better results. Iterative process. Yes. So yeah, I just think that's something for us to be thinking about moving forward collectively as a bot. Like, you know, what do we do with our collective desire to help each other submit better, stronger applications? And that I don't think we quite have an answer for. I think one thing last year that was complicated for the sabbatical applicants is because we were putting together a new process. Last year was the first year we had a sabbatical committee and things like that. Applicants were very unclear, like, who is the audience that we're writing for? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we definitely heard some of that feedback from applicants where it was like, is this like a grant proposal where like it's very technical and whatever? Is this like I'm sending it to like a lay audience? And, right. you know, the sweet spot is a little bit in the middle, right? It's it's for an academic audience more than anything else, but an academic audience that probably lacks disciplinary knowledge. So, you know, while people are filling in that question of, you know, describing the current proposed project, I think I would urge you to sort of use your best judgment with regard to how much disciplinary jargon you're using and things like that. Um, we respect your disciplinary knowledge. You're going to know far more about your field than any of us yeah. will. So um, I think kind of the benefit of the doubt is given to applicants that they are applying their disciplinary knowledge correctly. That's not something that we're evaluating at all. And I, I guess, and let, I mean, we can continue to talk about process stuff, but I do feel like part of, you know, I don't, for anyone here who's either themselves interested or interested in mentoring other faculty, talking about some of the stuff that might present a problem, like being more clear about how to address these criteria and the time that remains, just because I do want, since we don't really have a great iterative process right now, at least we can use this group and our, 
our role as faculty members mentoring other people to sort of say, okay, so what is it? What does a good one look like? What tone, what's your audience, for example? And I think, yeah, uh, a well-informed academic audience who's not a specialist in your discipline is the answer. Um, you know, it's not for a sixth grader. It's, you know, not for your co-author of that paper you're working on. Um, so, I mean, for me, I appreciate that the criteria are clear. Um, they're not expansive, but enhance the university educational environment, promote the professional development of eligible bargaining unit members by affording opportunities for sustained, sustained periods of concentrated research and study while free from regular non-campus obligations. And I think that objectives, I, I like the, the clarity of that um, in 1411. You know, I remember struggling trying to figure out what's a sabbatical for and sitting in a room full of, people, of faculty members who couldn't even agree on that, right? You know, oh, it's time to recharge your batteries. Well, yeah, not according, you know, like, so I think the the clarity of that is good. Did anyone have any questions about 1411 or should we just move on to, and I want to hear from you again more than you want to hear from me about 14112 and the ways of addressing these criteria. I mean, I, I ultimately have lots of questions about what do you mean by this? I mean, like if I look at um, just the words concentrated research and study, like, you know, on one of my sabbaticals, I wrote a textbook. Yes, I did some research and study, but mostly it was me presenting knowledge that I already had for a particular class that, uh, we teach here at CSU. So I, I like the language is a little, I'm, I don't know, and I know it's in the CBA, so there's nothing we can do about it, but. But is it fleshed out in 14112? Does that help answer? Well, in 14, the criteria? the one that makes me nervous is the quality of the proposal. That's the very first thing. They'll be judged on the quality of the proposal. I don't know what that means. I Does that mean if I have how typos? we interpreted it last year? Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Does it mean if I have typos in the proposal, that's a problem, or are we? I, I'd love to hear how you interpreted it. Um, typos, we were not concerned with. If the proposal was um, very disorganized to the point where it was unclear what the proposed project was, or it didn't look like there was a clearly proposed project, right? Where somebody was like, I'm gonna take this time and do something with it. It was, you know, that those were issues where we were like, I'm concerned about the quality of this proposal. Um, so we weren't we weren't evaluating anyone's grammar or anything like that. Um, but I, I do think organization of ideas probably played a role because if we couldn't follow what the project was, um, then that, was definitely a topic of discussion. And I would echo proposals. that at my level of review. I'm not interested in how elegant and, and, and well written it is. I don't want it to be sloppy because I think that reflects a lack of concern. But even that would, you know, I say, oh, how lame. You should take a little more care. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at, you know, the way that it's structured, what the goal is, what the steps are, what the time frame looks like, what are the outcomes, does it seem realistic? What's some of the motivations? How's it linked to things you've done in the past? And it doesn't have to be all of those things, but a, a thoughtful um, story. To so what extent have you flushed out some sort of plan? Right. So I would suggest an online forum is not conducive to everybody understanding that what they should be doing is writing this ahead of time and cutting and pasting. Like, it, you know, an online form, especially I went through it, you know, a little bit. It doesn't save your answers for anything. So, like, I can see somebody getting in there and starting to do stuff on the fly, right? And and that's going to be a different kind of proposal than if somebody understands, oh, I'm supposed to, like, have something more formal. Okay, I think... Um... There are virtues to having an online form oh, in terms the of the workflow. Personal. So I think this might be one where the onus is on us.
to make sure that our faculty colleagues, you know, and people new to the the PSU understand that. And mm -hmm. again, I think part of the reason it's really important to me this get together and that we talk about this with our colleagues is there's a lot of Yes, unspoken, right? I mean, there's a lot of the stuff under the surface. There's not much here. Mm -hmm. It's what's necessary and it's what we agreed on and it reflects the CBA. So it's what we have to do. But there's a lot of knowledge that all of you have and we have based on past experience. Like this should be something you work on quite seriously mm -hmm. for quite a while with reflecting and going back and forth and getting feedback. And it should be a nice thing that at the very end, <laughs> when it's application time, you cut and paste. And you're right, that's not obvious from this. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how to, I mean, maybe we can think about adding at a later date, a paragraph sort of talking a, a little more about how to approach this, mm -hmm. not sure. And I think having more sabbatical information sessions, which is something new that, you know, was not an option mm -hmm. when I went up for right. sabbatical, I, I do think that that is really important and really helpful. Um, and to get a PDF of the form up where people can see it so that they don't have to click through the form in order to see the whole right. thing. Right. Or make a form where you can say, I mean, because I can say, you know, I get interrupted in my office all the time and I would be really bummed if I was halfway through and something happened, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, and I think you should change the form right now to show the entire form, uh, the one that's posted at the OAA site. Um, it would be helpful if people could preview the whole, you know, see everything at once. Um, as opposed because to you're using the same form for sabbatical leave and oh, right. and separate for, leave, leave without uh, pay. There's yeah. a skip pattern. There's a skip pattern, and that's why. Form. Thank you. Yeah, it would be maybe really easy to just separate those into two forms where you click which one you want at the beginning, but whatever. Not this year. Yeah, because um, that is a problem. I can't remember how I jerry-rigged it to f earlier or, or who I contacted to get the whole form, but otherwise I think I would have been exactly in Kathy's situation where I was just like, oh, I, I just, you know, I clicked it. Now I just got to write it or whatever, or maybe I clicked through it to figure it out. Um, I, I also have another question, which I don't think we're going to deal with here necessarily, but I'm curious to hear Nate's perspective. And it's something that affects certainly me and Matt. And then I think as the university evolves, it's going to affect more people, which is I'm curious about whether we have any sense of um, whether you have, whether you can basically produce a sabbatical project completely outside of the discipline for which you are, you know, hired to teach. Um, and I, I, I feel like maybe the answer would be yes, as long as you can answer these criteria so that you can show there's some, you know, service to these different areas. Um, but it's an interesting question as people become more interdisciplinary. I'll give you an example using using Matt because um, no one ever has to worry about Matt yeah. not <laughs> getting a sabbatical leave or full professor or anything else because he's so uh, over the top amazing. So, you know, if his field is inside of interdisciplinary studies, but his original PhD, of course, is in English and he wants to write a modernist study of whatever, it, it seems to me that those kinds of projects are actually helpful to the university that we want to become where, where people are moving across these silos, even in their, um, even in their work. But I'm just curious what we think about that. And I, I, one thing I was thinking about is like for myself and I am not doing this, but like, what if I wanted to write a young adult novel um, you know, I don't teach anything or do anything related to that, but I was like, oh, this is my chance to write my novel. And of course, other people could write novels like, you know, Liz all could write a book of poetry that's absolutely in her wheelhouse, but so I could, she would pass with that project. Would I pass with the same project? Um, is it really just about being able to say, oh, I can link this to things or I don't know. Has anybody else thought about this or have any 
thoughts? I have, and I'm sure others have. And I think the answer is actually quite easy, but it does go back to something we were talking about earlier. This is why it really does need to be a conversation and iterative process. Come to me, go to go to your colleagues, go to your AU leader, go to like, this is a conversation to be had. Can I say uniformly the answer is yes? No, I can't, because there are going to be cases where someone says, well, I've never, ever done this, and I want to do a sabbatical, explore, I want to do high-level chemical analysis of hyper-subatomic particles at high altitude. Well, Nate, you're a philosophy professor. Now, like, no, you can't do that, Nate. I am not going to pay for you to go do that. <laughs> but So there are silly cases where we can imagine where you'd say no, but I think... <laughs> Most of the time, it's in a really interesting question. You know, what's my background? Is that even relevant anymore? What have I been doing for the last chunk of time? How does it connect to what I want to be doing for the next chunk of time? I, so I think but it's nuanced. I want to push back on that, actually. Even your silly example. I mean, I, the likelihood of you completing that project in the proposed timeline is probably low. Right. So probably score low there. But like if if you have that background, why would we say no to something? Because I just put that in. I, I put that in the chat too, Kathy. That's exactly what I said. I was like, I would have said yes to that. Like assuming the proposal was good. <laughs> Before you said yes and funded it as the provost, you'd say, okay, I, I don't quite see why. What's the, how does that connect to what you've done? And maybe the answer is nothing. Okay, well then, what's the what are the legs for Plymouth State and and you and and our students? What are they going to get out of this new endeavor of yours so again there's there's questions that have to be answered before i why, could why would you ask that question any differently than if matt let's say matt was in english and you wanted to write a modernist manuscript uh, about some obscure writer yep that five people are going to read yep. like that those are sabbaticals that get approved right mm -hmm. so I, I guess I'm not sure I quite understand what you're saying. What I'm saying is I would have to know, I mean, again, we have 4,000 characters here, right? And I think it's complicated. My inclination is to say, yeah, I think I could come up with a scenario, like in a, a description of practically any um, worthwhile endeavor for any of us if it were situated and explained. Yeah. Okay. But I'm not going to uniformly say yes with a... But yes, Robin, my instinct is that, yeah, I'm not, I'm certainly not worrying about what someone's PhD is in when they're applying for a sabbatical, that's for sure. I would agree with that. I think where it would come into play for the committee, and at this point, I think, you know, I think sometimes if you are a faculty member who is doing a project that is, like the example Nate gave, that is very far outside your discipline to sort of make the case for, you know, why you're able to complete that project and things like that. Because I would have questions if a philosophy professor was suddenly like, I'm doing this elaborate, you know, physics experiment or something like that, because I would want to be able to evaluate whether or not they would be able to actually complete the proposed project, right? Whether they had the knowledge base to, right. to do that, if that's realistic for them otherwise they're setting themselves up to fail at the end of the sabbatical right. they still have to submit a report being like here's what i did and you know are we putting them right. in a position where that report is going to look favorable for the faculty member or no um but like for my own sabbatical i would say i completed a project that was outside of my discipline in the sense of what my phd was in but was very consistent with my background because a lot of my background is in like areas where CJ overlaps with other disciplines like public health and psychology. And so my sabbatical project was drawing very heavily on previous publications that I had in public health and um, in psych. And so it wasn't strictly criminal justice. But I did make a point in my sabbatical application to explain how this expanded on my previous work. But again, also to your point, Robin, about not in, inventing the wheel and stuff, I wish we could have more conversations like this as a faculty and have a more iterative process so that the answer could be like anything, right? I mean, if there was enough time to think about it and, and work on it and contextualize it, there's in principle, I could say yes to everything, but that that would need conversation and fleshing out and the ability to ask questions of clarification and that's all. Make sense? 
she's typing. <laughs> I, I yeah. yes, it makes sense. I mean, I'm not sure that iterative is really the point. I think the point is again the app, the content of the application. So, you know, if people are able to propose projects yeah. that move in very different directions than their fields, you would just need an application that allowed them to supply the information that you feel like you would need to make a, a judgment. Um, but yeah, I and, and I think this is all, you know, good. I just, I do think we're gonna start to see more of this, right? Um, it, hopefully we'll start to see more of this as cluster majors no evolve. And also even I'm thinking about, you know, one thing that happens too, as we're trying to keep up, like we're thinking about teaching in a new way, right? We're thinking about keeping up with culture and with students as they want to evolve into new areas. So sometimes the work we will do will be to evolve into a new area. Um, and that might include learning things we aren't expert at. And that would be, oh, I've had, you know. So I've that. had great sabbatical applications for someone to start a major new multi-year project in an area that they don't specialize in. So I've seen that and I've approved it. So I'm, I, you know, but again, as you're saying, and we're all, it's all in the application and, and the story that you tell and how you flesh that out. And to learn how to do that is where I guess I'm asking for the iterative process and, and supporting each other so that they are strong applications, whatever we're trying to do. It seems like in the best interest of the faculty, if we were able to put something in here that the sabbatical committee, if they had questions and were inclined to say no, they could give the faculty a second opportunity, right? And we can certainly do that for the next um, contract because this is new and we didn't, we had no idea what we we're getting ourselves into. Um, and but we could even do it faster, perhaps with a with a memorandum of understanding. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would ask Laura, based on your time, like I'm gonna sound cynical. I don't mean to, but like, would that would that be put to use? Do you think, or is it like again, how busy we all are, and and wanting to support each other, and not wanting necessarily like it's difficult to say no to a colleague, right? So just honestly, how much do you think that would add? I think there were, I forget how many total applications we looked at last year, but there were two where we yep. felt like we did not have the information necessary to fully. But you said yes to them. We said yes because our, to be honest about our reasoning, we totally kicked the can. <laughs> we said yes because we were like, we are backing up against this deadline. Yeah we want to give this faculty member the benefit of the doubt because the form was not conducive to the criteria. So we don't want to penalize a faculty member for not addressing something that they weren't asked to address. Mm -hmm. And we were sort of like, if the provost has a clarifying question, we guess we can ask And him. I did ask some clarifying questions. But I he had a little bit more time than we did. I had a but, little more time, so I did But all we did was kick the can down the road. But I think that would be good if there were a chance, if, if there was a way to build in so that it wasn't just, because I think, yeah, we, there were some considerable variability among the applicants, which there always is, and that's fine, and to be expected, different styles and voices and disciplines and everything, but there were some conspicuous um, challenges in a few of them. Right. well, I have a meeting with the student app on 30. I think this was somewhat helpful. Thank you, yeah. So any questions for me? I mean, again, I came here selfishly, honestly. Um, I'm still getting my head around this. It's a new process for me. Um, the Boyer model is new to me. Sabbatical applications are always fraught and complicated everywhere I've ever been. Not not quite as fraught as P and T, but you know, it's it's one of these things we have to do together to try and get right. So. Uh, a question would yes. be as far as um, sort of planning would be, uh, when do you anticipate a decision at your level as far as course planning for the following semester? Yeah, that's one of the tricky things. Right. The, the sabbatical, my decision timing as required in the CBA, which I don't remember exactly what it is. Do I decide by the 20th? Sorry, I should know this stuff better. 
Um, the, yeah. Yeah, December 20th. The entire committee gets the basic. You get them. Though. I get them on the 20th, oh, and then I have to give them. Yeah, I forget what it is, but. So my goal is to get them. Again, I'd like to be, if I have concerns, <laughs> I'd like to give faculty the benefit of the doubt. And then, but the schedule's already been done by the time I get them. No, it hasn't. I mean, not for the fall. no, for the okay. fall they haven't, but for the, so. But these applications would yeah. not be. These applications no. are for next these are for, year. No, but I'm just thinking, so when I did it this year, I would, by the time I was getting to approving, I was slow this last time around. So I will try and be, as, I guess that's the balancing act for me. I'll try and be as fast as I can while giving people a chance. So if they're all perfect, I can try and get it done over the Christmas break. Um, you know, that would be in a perfect world, but that's, that's a, I can't guarantee that. I'll try and be more expeditious than last year when I was definitely too slow. And I'll own that one. And I think we got them to you last year on the day they were due. Yeah. It was December 20th. Yep. Was and early. I, you know, by then I was just hanging on for dear life like we all were and then going into the Christmas break and then somewhere on the other side, I realized, oh no, I have so. And then scramble during Christmas break, trying to find faculty to talk to, which slowed the, you know, those two slowed the entire dozen down. Because I had I wanted to have conversations with them before, and I didn't want to decide on some before others. So I'll try and hopefully they're all brilliant, and it's a non-issue. Robin's typing away. Any other questions from from Zoom? All done. Was this at all helpful? Yes. Semi, I got a, a semi shrug from Mariska. All right, <laughs> I'll take it. Um, well, thank you all. I mean, it's good for me. Like I said, I came here selfishly to hear from you. So I appreciate the time and uh, enjoy the, the newfound cold weather. Thank you.